Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you haven't met yet, my name is Eric and I'm a PhD student in mathematics at Oxford working on network science. In this video, we're breaking down how Google Maps is able to give you the fastest route between virtually any two points on Earth. Their recipe includes petabytes of data, a lot of network science and an algorithm developed in 1956 during a shopping round on a cafe terrace in Amsterdam. Let's talk about Exter Dijkstra and his eponymous algorithm. Given two cities, what's the fastest drive between them? That is such a complex question to answer. No matter how you choose the two cities, not only there are thousands of possible routes between them, but every single one of them will be influenced by traffic. So we need to simplify. We could ask instead, given two cities, what is the shortest drive between them? Now, all we need to do is to map all of the roads near the two cities and find the shortest one. It's not a simple task, but at least we don't have to deal with traffic, which varies across the day and between different days. On top of that, we don't need to think about roadworks, traffic jams, speed limits, and all of that. It's not easy, but it's so much simpler. Take this example from the center of Oxford, and let's consider only the major roads for simplicity. Take High Street, for example. It's the main road that goes through the center of Oxford, and it's also one of the most beautiful ones. It's surrounded by colleges and hasn't changed in centuries. The proper High Street starts from this roundabout down here and continues all the way to the Carfax Tower, to this crossroad here that is considered to be the very center of Oxford. But for the purpose of our analysis, we don't consider it a single entity. You see, when we're interested in the shortest possible path between two points, we don't necessarily travel the whole length of a road, but instead, every crossroads give us the option to deviate away from a road into another one. For this reason, the basic units of our problem are not the road themselves, but any stretches of roads connecting consecutive interchanges. If we do that, we can simplify things down and encode our data as a graph, in which crossroads are the nodes and the edges are the stretches of roads that connect to crossroads. And if we do this representation in our example, we get something like this. Now the question is, how can we use these properties to find the shortest path on the graph? A Dutch computer scientist found the answer for us. And the most amazing thing is, he found it while shopping with his fiance in an Amsterdam mall 67 years ago. The story of Dijkstra's algorithm is the story of how a physicist at a crossroad turned into a pioneer in computer science. Edsker Dijkstra had decided to pursue theoretical physics, and it wasn't until he had a transformative conversation with his supervisor that he saw the potential of programming and decided to dedicate himself to computer science instead. The story of how the algorithm was discovered is just as curious as the story of his creator. The algorithm was invented during a shopping break in an Amsterdam mall in 1956, when Dijkstra was shopping with his fiance. He was thinking about the shortest path problem and the shortest way to travel from Rotterdam to Groningen. When he stopped for some time to think about the problem, he came up with a solution in just 20 minutes. Published in 1959, the algorithm is famed for its elegance and simplicity, something that Dijkstra himself attributed to the fact that he had to design it only in his mind, without having access to pen and paper. Which, if you ask me, is quite remarkable for an algorithm that today is run billions, if not trillions of times, every single day. So, how does it work? Let's help ourselves with a simple graph to illustrate what's going on. This will be our graph, and we want to find the shortest path between node A and node I at the opposite ends of the graph. There are quite a lot of possible paths, so enumerating all of them to find the shortest is not a very efficient method. Instead, let's explore the distances on the graph little by little and let's classify the nodes into three categories. The ones that we have already explored, that we will mark in green, 
the ones that we are currently exploring, which we will mark in blue, and the ones we haven't explored yet, marked in red. Because we're starting from node A, we consider this node as explored, and we mark it in green. Also, we haven't done anything else yet, so it makes sense that all other nodes are marked in red, as unexplored. Then, the algorithm will go through the same three steps repeatedly. First, we update the exploration list, that is, which nodes we're currently exploring and are marked in blue. Then, we update the distances of the nodes that are in the exploration list, and finally, we move to the closest node in the exploration list and we repeat the three steps from that node. It's all very abstract and hand-wavy at the moment, so let's do it in our example. So, let's start with step one. We add all of the neighbors of the nodes that we have already explored into the exploration list, and we mark them in blue, as we're going to explore them next. Step two, we calculate the distance from our original node A to all of the nodes that are currently marked in blue. So, in our example, step one corresponds to marking node B and C in blue, then we update the shortest possible distance of all the blue nodes, so far only B and C again, from A. Since they are connected directly, their distance will be 2 and 3 respectively. Step 3, we move the node in the exploration list that is closest to the starting node A to the explored list, and we repeat from that node. In our case, that node is B, so we color it in green. So now our explored nodes are A and B, C is in the exploration list, and all other nodes are unexplored. And we are now exploring from node B. Now we need to repeat the cycle from step 1 again. Add all of the neighbors of B to the exploration list, then update their distance. Node E and D are only reachable from A through B, so their distance will be the distance from A to B, plus the weight of the edges from B. So in our case, the provisional distance from A to D will be 5, and from A to E will be 6. Step 3 now. Move the node in the exploration list with the minimum distance from A to the explore nodes. In our example, the closest node is C, so let's color it green. Now we go through the same three steps again. The neighbors which aren't in the exploration lists already are F and G. Node B is a neighbor of C, but it's explored already, so we don't need to do anything there. In fact, notice how going to B through C would incur a longer distance than going directly from A. This is a byproduct of how the algorithm works, and it's always the case for visited nodes. Basically, this means that we can leave the green nodes alone. Going to node E via C, however, yields a distance of 4, which is lower than the one we had estimated before with the path through B, so we need to update this estimate. Now, node E is the blue nodes with the smallest possible distance from A, so let's repeat the three steps from there. So let's add node H to the exploration list, with node G being blue already. Updating the distances yield 5 for node H, and again 7 for node G, so there's nothing to update there. We're now done with node E, so let's color it in green. Now, both nodes D and H have the same distance from the origin, 5, so we can select which one to explore from at random. Let's say we choose node H. We color I in blue, and we update its distance as 10. And we also need to update the distance of node G as 6, because that's lower than the estimation we have done so far, which was 7. We're now done with node H, so let's color it in green. Now, the blue node with the minimum distance from A is D, but it only connects to green nodes, so we already know that we don't have anything to do there. So let's just color D in green and move on. The next closest node to A is G, which only connects to node I. Checking the new estimation of the distance of node I coming from node G yields 9, which, when I last checked, was smaller than 10. Let's update that, color G in green, and we're done. Next, the blue node with the smallest distance from A is F, but it once again only connects to green nodes so we know there's nothing for us to do with it. 
Let's just color it in green and the following node with the smallest distance in the exploration list is node i. And because node i was our target, the algorithm terminates. Now we can backtrack the path from a to i by checking when we last updated the distance estimations. We assign distance 9 to node i when we were updating node g. The distance of node g was last updated coming from node h, which was updated from node e, which was updated from C, which connects to our starting node directly. So, the shortest path between node A and node I goes through nodes C, E, H and G, and has a distance equal to 9. Note that, while we did have to explore all possible nodes, we have saved a lot of work over the naive way of listing all possible paths. For example, in principle there is no reason why we shouldn't check this path here, even though it's clearly ludicrous. Okay, so Dijkstra's algorithm gives us the shortest path on a graph, but how do we go from that back to our original problem of getting the fastest directions from A to B? This last step is conceptually very easy, but practically it's a feat of digital engineering. If you have access to the scale of data that Google has, you could estimate the time that it takes to travel on every stretch of roads, as we have defined them above. After that, you assign the weights of the edges not in terms of the length of the stretch of the road between two crossroads, but instead in terms of travelling time. If you create the same graph that we've just seen above, voila! You're just one run of Dijkstra's algorithm away from presenting your users with the fastest routes. And because traffic influences the transit times on a given stretch of road, Google Maps has also implemented a system that allows to correct for sudden congestions and traffic jams. This allows to reroute in real time all or some users that are due to transit the congested roads, making their journeys faster and alleviating the congestion at the same time. And the way this data is collected is through your phone. The application can measure the speed you're traveling at, so if it suddenly sees several cars doing a walking pace on a motorway stretch, they can quickly figure out that something has gone terribly wrong in that area. The edge weight would be updated, Dijkstra's algorithm rerun, and users rerouted according to the new, more efficient solution. If you're curious about what I do for my PhD in network science and how it relates to these real-world applications, you could take a look at this video here, in which I explain the research I've been working on for the past three years. Also, please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this, coming out twice a week on Wednesdays and Sundays. Until next Sunday, goodbye!